work. For you're me. treating me like a person. And then I did not go to seminary to be treated like a person. I can tell you that. <laughs> I could put a bow tie on. That would be nice. My, on you know, on yeah. Power. I could draw one. That yeah. yeah. oh yeah. 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 would be really good. Frank, that would be nice. Frank, Frank says uh, you can't put a tie on your other car because you want a clip on won't work. <laughs> But, but, and I don't think I've ever worn it to, to one of these hats. I don't wear it as much anymore because the ones I have are kind of gotten worn out. I have to order them for when I wear tags. When I wear my tags. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Boy, tell me I don't look like the Quaker of God. <laughs> Yeah, we're not, we're not talking about Charlie today. I was, I was wearing. You're into like doing impressions, aren't you? Oh yeah, I, I'll Frank. Tell you, I was Charles. I was. Uh, uh, this is, of course, this is pre beater And uh, although someone asked who will remain nameless if I'm becoming Hasidic. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm becoming Orthodox. So, you know, it's and the I, same, same thing. My family is going to have competition with you. My cousin's uh, grandson is graduating from Presbyterian Ministry in oh, Mississippi. Oh, very nice. Yes, this month. Very, very I nice. Know, I thought they only allowed Baptist down there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought he had grown a beard. You no, know, it's going to be competition, Presbyterian okay. Okay, well that's, that's, I'm ready for competition because I'm old enough to quit. And, and he has a head of hair that is carrot red. It is red, red. A lot of hair. But anyway, I'm, I'm not wearing, as you say, I'm wearing civilian clothes. I'm wearing civilian clothes. Well, you always wear a because, shirt. Well, yeah, I'm wearing underwear, too. So well, you don't go in the Thanks for telling me. Thanks. I didn't. He <laughs> went too yeah. far. And, and, and I'll tell you, ladies, I don't know how to handle those thongs. Anyway. TMI. That goes. That almost is uncomfortable as a speedo. But. Um, the, uh, that'll give you, hey, that'll give you nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, but see, I'm doing, and this may apply to anybody here, uh, if, if you're, you know, in, I don't know, in the market. Um, I, see, I'm doing, I'm doing a wedding uh, this, afternoon. this afternoon in Pittsburgh. Oh, um, so I'm, I'm leaving here going to Pittsburgh, oh. and it is, it is a secular wedding. You know, so they, they don't want... Any mention of God in their in their service, which is okay, because I am of the belief that God's going to be there anyway, whether they want to I don't care. You know, and I'm not a you know I'm not a name dropper. <laughs> you know, he's going to be there regardless. Oh wait a minute! Uh, yes, you are, <laughs> because John keeps giving you those things to drop in your sermon. Oh yeah, well, it's true. It's true. Yeah. you know, the last time I was talking to the governor, uh, I decided not to drop name. Uh, but the, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm wearing now. If anybody, in fact, I've got a wedding. I've got a wedding at two, and this is a Wednesday. Geez, yeah. I got a wedding at two o'clock at the uh, West End Overlook in Pittsburgh. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, West End Overlook, place. which is which is very nice. I've done weddings there before. Uh, so we're doing a wedding there, and then at six o'clock tonight, I'm doing another wedding. Well, um, well, you're not going to be able to here help me. In, oh. Here in Stubbenville. <laughs> so. You're not going to be able to help me with all my junk that's going to be coming for the flea market tonight. <laughs> I'm going to be doing a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so. He's not bringing it tonight. <laughs> if, if anybody here wants to get married, I have got a service in my car. Oh, I'm no. looking at you, Gene. Uh, <laughs> if anybody here wants to get married, you know, <laughs> I've got a service moment, in my car. Spur the moment, you that's oh, that's right. Cheaper. And and Just I like fill in the blanks. That's it. I have started. Oh, I have one more time. There's a story I got to tell. You, by the way, uh, and I started a new promotion. I I don't know whether it's going to catch on or not. But I started a new promotion. Like a food truck. If, if, um, 
a food truck. Don't you have a well, food truck? Well, the, uh, no, a wedding truck to no, go. No, no, well, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> I, I, will, I, will give you, I will give you a coupon. Oh. Half price on your next wedding. Are you going <laughs> you know, so, No, yeah. thank you. One was enough. <laughs> yeah, you said he'd do them cheaper. <laughs> you got a brother D, you got a cut your weddings? <laughs> He's undercutting you. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that works better. I did was give him a card that you punched out. You know, and when you hit the number five, you get it free. You know, but that didn't catch on very well. My sister did it. I know. All right. So, so anyway, I, I do it, but I've got to, I've got to tell you, baby, someone said about a license, the paperwork. And I did a, uh, I was going to do a wedding, it was about a month ago. And it was in Mor down in Morgantown. And and it was one of these deals, and I do I do a lot of way, um, you know, a lot of way. Um, I'd make more if I could do divorces too, but they don't let me do that. Uh, but they do a lot but of you way. could have divorces. Yeah. Have to get Sometimes at the same time. Some people, uh, have, yeah. But I'm doing, and, and so I get in contact, and they they want it's just going to be the three of us. And you know, there's a myth, and most of y'all know this. If you don't, it's a myth that you need witnesses. You know, they always on TV. You, well, we got to have witnesses. You don't need witnesses. There's no witnesses. You know, on the marriage license, the bride and groom don't even sign. You know, they do that at the courthouse when they pick it up. I'm the only one that signs a license. At least, you know, in every state I've ever worked, you've never needed witnesses on the on the license. Anyway, so I I go down there. I said, Morgan down, they're gonna, it's just gonna be the three of us at ten o'clock in the morning. Ten o'clock in the morning, it's just the three of us. They just want to get married. Uh, I'm okay with that. So I go down 10 o'clock in the morning down to, uh, to Morgantown, and, and they're students. So they are so <laughs> And we're meeting, Get, this is a student place. I guess the Blue Moose Cafe. <laughs> the Blue Moose Cafe. And you know, in, in Morgantown, cafes, and you may not know this, cafes are different than cafes in where? Because I go in and I, there's no game, gaming machines oh, in the Blue oh, Moon. Well, yeah. They're and, actually and serving it has, coffee. It has to say and more. Oh, and more. Yeah. And oh, and more. And more. <laughs> but this had no more. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. So that was a real cafe. Can't so even I, get coffee in this place is weird. I know you can. <laughs> so, but you can get more. Uh, so I'm, I'm there. Show up at the Blue, and I'm sitting there waiting for them. And you know, these are the young couple. They come in. And I, well, I first I text them because I got her her number, and I text her and say I'm here, uh, and she said okay, uh, we're we're on way. So I'm sitting there, uh, drinking a uh, Blue Moose Cafe special, <laughs> and, and so I'm sitting at a table drinking. And I, you know, there are couples coming in, and they're all so young because this is a college area, not camp, you know, but college kids living. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in four states, making that comment's illegal. Uh, your, your pants are ringing. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, but anyway, the, uh, uh, so I'm there drinking my coffee, and, and the couple's coming in and out, and I'm sitting there, and this young couple comes in, but they're talking to the, the person behind the counter. Everybody is heavily pierced. Uh, you know, a lot of tattoos. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there, uh, and uh, I get a, a, a text, and she, it's from her, and says, where are you? And I said, I'm here. And she, she said, are you the old guy at the bar? Oh. <laughs> and I look over there, there's an old guy in the bar. And I said, no, I'm an old guy in a booth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and, you know, I want her to be confused, but she said, oh, I see you. <laughs> Which kind of, kind of dropped my, you know, I kind of feel better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and so they come over, and, and I, we, we talk a little bit. And then a nice couple, she's going to graduate this year, going to be a nurse, and, and so she'll do fine. She'll get, she already got a job, and she's ready. To, he's graduating in forestry. Which means she will support him for yeah. years and years yeah. and years, uh, but uh, you know until he gets a job at the mall uh, and um, uh, you know maybe Capellas something like that. Yeah, there you so go. He's there, but they're a nice couple. We're, we're talking, and uh, then I said, okay, uh, now we need license, and they reach into the pocket and pull out the driver's license, and and, and um, I said, you know I don't want to make them feel stupid. 
you know, so, you know, because they're young, you know, it's so easy to make young people feel stupid, you know, obviously. And, and so they've got the license there, and, I, and I, so I look at them, and, and I'll say, oh, that's very nice. And, uh, you know, check the date of when they were born. Uh, and, and then I hand them back, and, and we talk a little bit more, and then I say, okay, okay, now we need the license. And they pull out the wallet again. <laughs> and, they, and I said, no, 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 no. I mean your marriage, the marriage license. And they look at one another, and she ladles at me and says, don't you bring it? Oh, and, 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 and I said, no. She said, we thought you would come in with a briefcase full of marriage license. Oh. <laughs> and and you spent it out here. And, and I, said, I said, no, let me explain to you. I, I can't do it. In fact, I can't do it. You know, I can't get you a license. That you've got to get through the county. And in fact, the woman at the desk from whom you get your license, she can't marry you. You know, so it's got to be a two-step process. I said, so you need, she said, I said, well, what? She said what, what, what are we going to do? And I said, well, you, you know, I, 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 can't, I don't have licenses. You know, so I can't, you've got to go to the courthouse. Courthouse is closed on Saturday. Uh, I said, I'll tell you what, because this is, well, this is the date. You know, this was the date we first, I, I don't know, uh, shared a burrito. Uh, well, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, sort of like, you know, that, that movie with the dogs. You know, like, you know, we were eating at two ends and came and kissed in the middle. Oh, I don't know. Lady in the Tramp. Lady in the Tramp. Yeah, Lady in the Tramp. Uh, anyway, she, so she, I, she, what are we going to do? I said, well, I'll tell you. Uh, because we did this, we had to do it before I married a woman who was in, to a doctor, they were both doctors. It was a Hindu Christian service, which was very interesting. Uh, and she didn't have, she didn't know she needed a license. And the thought that I provided. And her husband thought she was stupid, you know, which is embarrassing. Uh, and, and so I said, this is what happened before. This is what you can do. Why don't you go to the courthouse? Get your, your license. Now understand on the license, I can't put the date, you know, of today. Because that would mean I had married you before you had a license, and I can't do that. So they'll have to post date when you got the license. But what I do, and I do it, I don't know if Brother Gene does it when he was marrying folks, or any of, of you who marry people. Um, <laughs> what I do is I, I always make a certificate in my office, you know, for oh, couples, yeah. because the, the one from the yeah. county is pretty, yeah, not very really good. Yeah. You know, so I'll make one that's better for framing. Uh -huh. And I said, what I'll do is I'll make one of those for you with this date in it. Because you can you can recognize, you can celebrate your marriage anytime you want. Right. You know, your anniversary. And you know, in the sight of God, you were married today. You made your pledge today, and the other one is in the eyes of the state. Right. You know, that's love last importance and all that. And so I said, we could do that, but but I would send it registered. When you get it, send it to me, registered mail. Right. And and I'll take care of the rest. And uh, she she they looked at each other and said, Well, if it means doing all that, uh, we would have a bigger wedding later in Hancock, Maryland, where I'm from. So why don't we just put it off? We just put it off. And, and I said, okay, well, that's your business. And they said, thanks for coming. <laughs> from where to Morgantown, you know. Well, they, she said, uh, they, well, even, even in the initial conversation. And he said, we don't have much money. Would you do it for, you know, X number of dollars? Because usually I, I do a wedding for $100 and then mine. And um, I, they said, and $100 was too much. Can, can you do it for, and you know, these kids, can you do it for $95? You know, <laughs> we don't have $100. And I said, you oh, know, what would you feel comfortable paying? And you know, they said, said well, would $79 I'll do it when you do your wedding for $79. And, uh, and no mileage, you know, $75 would be good. And she said, well, you know, then they take, she takes out a wallet again, because she's the only one that's got money, you know. And she says, how much? And I said, well, you know, 20. And, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so she gives me, she gives me 20 and we weigh you. Know, and uh, so, but the you wedding that never well, occurred. The, the well, I, it hasn't yet. You know, <laughs> the reason. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's my that's a life, one of my license stories. So if you plan on getting married, Look out. get a license. <laughs> well, I am. There's a remarkable site. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of sites. 
And uh, I, when I was in Indianapolis, I used to do a lot of weddings. But, but just to work with <coughs> people word about it, I'd work through friends. You know, I'd do a wedding for one friend, and then I'd work through the rest of it. But, you know, Weirton has fallen. And, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but Weirton's kind of old. <laughs> you know, it's not a, it is not a young community. So there's not a lot of, you know, weddings being, being done in Weirton. And, and so I, I've done, I like weddings. So I do, and I do them pretty well. Uh, so I did a whole lot less. Well, I, I got in touch with this, this group or this, um, well, it's, you can, you, through Thumbtack, you can get yourself a plumber, a carpenter, or an officiant for your wedding on Thumbtack. And, and I'll tell you something, I, I do about 60 a year. You know, through through Thumbtack, and and what the you know I've got my little I've got my little package on it, and and nowadays nowadays people don't have young people often don't have have church any any affiliation because the parents don't. You know, in the past parents did kids did so you go but now you got two generations that have no connection, and out finding a judge to do your marriage with is really hard right now. You know, it used to be you could show up at the Justice of the Peace, peace and then, and then but do it. getting a judge is hard. Some judges won't do marriages at all, That's and you you, they won't tell you when <laughs> judges are available. You got to call the courthouse, and they will only tell you when the shift changes and a new judge comes on, and that judge may not be willing to do it at all, or you may have to schedule. And if you do, they aren't cheap. You know, so it ends up these couples, where do they go to get an official? A lot of ministries and churches require a lot of counsel. You know, you gotta get counsel. And that's fine. Most <coughs> ministers, I'm gonna tell you as a minister, most of us don't know what we're doing. I mean, we really don't. <laughs> we've, had, we've had one counsel in class in our lives, and we're sitting down and let me explain to you marriage. Uh, you know, uh, the nuances of marriage. Uh, yeah, we don't know. You know, we don't know what we're doing. We're doing the best we can. And so I don't I say I don't require premarital counsel. I don't want to screw them out. You know? <laughs> you know what I do is I want to get to know them. If I hear a problem, I say that sounds like a problem. But once they come once they get to the point where they come to me, they are they're gonna get married. Either I'm gonna do it or somebody else is gonna do it. Oh, it's supposed so, to be the so American century. I am so anyway, they, they have a hard time finding somebody to do these. And I li I'm listed on Thumbtack, makes it really easy. So they see reviews, I got reviews, hmm. and you know, they'll contact me. I picked up three yesterday. Huh. Uh, <laughs> and, and they'll contact me and say, are you available on? And they'll tell me the kind of service, and I've got materials now, I've done it long enough, that I send them and they shape the service. So it becomes a good deal for them. You know, I do a lot of weddings, so it's, it's really easy. You know, it's like going to a surgeon that's done the same surgery a lot. You know, I don't get nervous. You know, I can I can kind of go on autopilot. I got a good personality. You know, I'm funny and you know relaxed and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, all right, I'm just going to get there. All right, the um, we're so but that's that's some time I get. And I'm on Wedding Wire and Wedding.com, so you can. I'm on several sites, but it's some time that I get most of the. Most of the they don't. They don't put the, that on Angie's list or something. Well, you know, when I first did it, I checked <laughs> Angie's list to oh, see if it, Angie's list listed officiants, and they don't. But Thumbtack does, and and I. So like if you, you know, if you were like a plumber and a preacher, you could probably do that. I've done that absolutely. But I am also get this. Excuse me. I am a motivational speaker. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Dale, I am a motivational. Dale speaker. Carnegie. Yes. Speaker. Yes. That's. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right. Anyway, we're looking at the end of. Oh, we're looking at the end of the series we we started about uh, American foreign policy. Let's go real fast, so we can. We got plenty of time at that as we talk about the future. Begins at the end, around the turn of the uh, 20th century. As we move into the 20th century, what's the situation in America that moves us outside of ourselves? Oh man, this is one of those affirming moments. I heard crickets. You know, I'm uh, All right. Yeah, okay, we got, we got industry. We're fed, finished with our mass, right? We are ready to do something. We got a difference of opinion. We got some folks that are saying what? 
Stay at home. We got other folks that are saying, get out. You know, not, not unlike discussions my wife and I have upon a day. You know, some people want to stay home, others want to go out. And and the stay at homers are people like Brian. William Jennings Bryan is a stay at homer. Andrew Carnegie is a stay at homer. Most of the Democrats go to Cleveland as a stay at homer. And we've got the let's get out and party folks. Okay, McKinley, Roosevelt, Roosevelt the, you know, Hearst, Pulitzer, those guys. They want to get out. All right. So we've got this tension in, in America, and this tension continues to be reflected as pendulum swings from stay at home to let's get out. And that's what we see over and over again. Politically tends to be, tends to be Democrats that tend to favor stay at home. Republicans, because of industry and trade, tend to want to get out. They, right. they historically been nationalists. Degrees from today. Yes, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> but the pendulum swings back and forth. So we've got it swung with McKinley, and we start getting involved. And what do we start acquiring? Because we are going to be involved in our world. Territory. Okay, we start getting territory, such as Philippines, Philippines, Philippines Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Guam. Guam, good. We don't want to neglect Guam, that great Hawaii. Spanish possession in the middle of the Pacific. Okay, Hawaii. what's that? Hawaii. Hawaii, very good. You know, influence into Latin American countries, particularly Central America and Caribbean. We are now expanding. We are building a Empire. canal. So we are going to be involved in our world, right? To be involved in the world, we've got to do what? Get out. We've got to get out in our world. And how are we going to get out in our world? With the Navy. Yeah, with the Navy, because we can't march there. There's water. You don't march through water. you got to have boats. So I only know one guy that can do that. Yeah. I mean, it's, we that's, a pretty, that's a pretty small army. Yeah, he, was pretty, pretty, he was pretty powerful. Well, you know, Sarah did the best he could. Uh, but, you know, we 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 got to build a Navy. So we build a Navy, and we get involved in the world in all kinds of jazz. Until 1912, when the pendulum starts swinging back the other way because he's elected in 1912. Like Woodrow Wilson, and he wins in an odd way. You know, probably shouldn't have won, you know, because the, his, the opposition was split. And when I say split, it was really split because you got two Republicans running, you know, and you got with, with different philosophies. But different philosophies that really don't involve a lot of foreign affairs. More internal economic differences between Taft and, and Roosevelt. Taft believed in a dollar diplomacy, money, you know, investments of money, but he was still he was still kind of an internationalist. You know, Roosevelt was an interventionist. So we, but we have them running against Wilson ends up doing what Democrats don't normally do. He won. You know, he wins his election and bang, who becomes the Secretary of State? Brian. Yeah. Jennings Bryant becomes Secretary of State. And so we know foreign policy is going to swing the other way. And Wilson adopts as opposed to the Roosevelt corollary where Roosevelt says we can be involved anywhere we want in the Western Hemisphere. This is our back y'all. And he said it with attitude. All right? So we move to a moral diplomacy, right? Under Wilson, which means how is he related to foreign countries? Free democracy. Yeah. democracy. Democracy. But it's going to be an internal democracy. It's not going to be like what we're saying we're doing in the Philippines. Because Roosevelt is saying, and McKinley, in the Philippines we are helping our little brown brothers acquire the principles we've had. And we're, we're also fighting a nasty guerrilla war. Well, we don't want to mention that. Those are, <laughs> those are some bad folks. You know, they're, they're just some renegades. You know, it worked with Native Americans, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're going to take over and impose, uh, not impose, the wrong word. We're going to <coughs> demonstrate our culture so that they acquire democratic principles by our involvement. Wilson believes the same thing, only how he does it is going to be different. Instead of doing it by governmental example, he's going to try to encourage through education people to elect better leaders, their own leaders. But it's a very different approach. You know, we're going to pull back in. New freedom. We're going to pull back in. We're going to focus on America and American needs, particularly 
economic need. We're not going to pay much about attention to the South, but we're going to pay a lot of attention to industry. Okay? <coughs> Pendulum swing out, right? What pushes it the other way? Really pushes a reluctant Woodrow Wilson, even in 1916, says, Man, I don't want to be involved in this war. They sunk the Lusitania in 1915. I still don't want to be involved in a war. You know? The trouble in Europe. Okay, you got a problem in Europe, but, you know, 1916, you know, big poster saying he kept us out of war. war. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Charles Evans Hughes wants to be involved. He's a Republican, wants to be more involved in, in Europe. Wilson says, man, we got to stay in. And, and look after ourselves. He isn't mobilizing. America's got, you know, like 114,000 soldiers total. We had no war production. We got nothing yeah, going on. Society. We'll sink, they got a world Police war department. going on there. They're sinking American ships. Are we doing anything yeah, to respond? Heck no. You know, heck no, we're not going to do it. And the American people are saying, yeah. Good. Good. That's fine. Good. Yeah. You know, because we don't want to be involved in Europe. They're always fighting. We don't want to get involved in those wars. You know, so Wilson is a very reluctant interventionist. What forces his hand? Thinking of American ships. But Man, the unrestricted German submarine warfare, when the Germans, because of Russian surrender, push all their money right on to 22 on the roulette table and say, we're going to go for broke. You know, and we're going to try to sink every American vessel coming into Britain. We're going to starve Britain. We're going to stir up trouble with Mexico. We're going to shift American attention. We know they're going to declare war on us. We know that. But by the time they, they get themselves, their act together, France will have surrendered. If France surrenders, Britain surrenders. We will have imposed our will on France and Britain. The war's going to be over. America may be at war with us, but... So what? Where are they going to fight us? You know, there's no place to fight us. You know, so we're, we're cool with that. And they do it. They gamble. A lot of things they could have done different didn't. The gamble doesn't pay off. You know, Americans get their act together faster. And Wilson then becomes, you know, but still he's, he's an odd kind of a internationalist. Because he never buys in totally to this war. You know, he's, the Americans aren't one of the allies there in auxiliary. You know, they're there, but they're not one of the allies. And he's got a very different set of, uh, set of priorities in fighting the war, right? So we get, we get Wilson, but the pendulum has swung more to internationalists. Then we're going to get a, a party that has historically tended to be in, focused on international issues. Republican Party, who's elected in 1920? Party. Party, even though we're returning to normalcy, that doesn't mean we're cutting ourselves off internationally, right? Because we are hosting a naval conference. You know, I should be advancing slides. The, uh, where, where, what's that? You see the parade. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. And, and so we're, we're still engaged. And we're going to re-engage in, in Central America. You know, so that's, that's what, what changes then. So we're, you know, Hoover is working with European orphans, you know, in recovery. So we are very much engaged. The Dawes plan, how we're going to help, yeah, how we're going to help Germany deal with its debt. All of those things are really major international, you know, <laughs> major international concerns. We just don't want to be involved in the league. What happens here and around the world to change? Depression. Great Depression. Stock market crash, Great Depression. And when the Great Depression occurs, who's elected? Hoover. Well, after the Great, you know, before, Roosevelt. after Roosevelt, of course, Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt is a what? Democrat. And Democrats tend to do what? Stay home. Stay home and focus on internal things. And that's what Roosevelt does. The New Deal did not involve helping Germany with their reparations. You know, it did. It had to do with America, right? And so the United States under Roosevelt, that's when we really become more isolationist. Now, he recognizes that, that Wilson, because he's Secretary of the Navy, actually Assistant Secretary of the Navy, under, Rose, oh, under Wilson, you know, he recognizes Wilson made some big mistakes, 
when things were gearing up in Europe, you know, he didn't prepare, America wasn't ready, so he's not going to be in that position. But they are not, you know, we, we're passing all kinds of laws saying we cannot be involved, even after the war in Europe starts. Okay, so during this interwar year, we, the pendulum again, swings to isolationism. So we've got it swinging again where we look internally and try to protect ourselves. <coughs> Again, what forces us to be internationals? Hitler. Okay, Hitler and the war. In particular, we were still, you know, man, Hitler is doing bad things. You know, during World War I, the Germans were doing bad things, but not like Hitler. You know, Hitler is horrible. And the Japanese are doing horrible things in China. I mean, this is terrible stuff. But the United States is still saying, don't bother me. Yeah. We're, we're, not, we're not going to do it. Yeah. We're not going to be involved. We do lend lease, but, but we're not going to be involved. American boys are not going to die in France again. We're not gonna, they're not going to die in France so that France can get a piece of Germany. Not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And American mothers are saying, yeah, boy, you're right. I don't want my boy dying. In, I don't want him dying in China. You know, to do what? I don't know. But he ain't going to be dying in China. You know, so we are, although Roosevelt's preparing and although he's held clearly, he's favoring one side over another, and he should, you know, we are not intervening until Pearl Harbor. <laughs> They blow up our stuff, we get mad. That's exactly right. <laughs> we end up blowing up their stuff, you know, because they blow up us. Now, understand, one of the cool, interesting things with, with Pearl Harbor, it's, it's, again, these huge bets that countries make. You know, we talked about it. Pearl, you know, destroying American presence in, in Hawaii, man, that is, Japan has a huge need. What, what's a big need? Oil. Oil. You gotta, they got to have oil. They, they need iron, but they got to have oil. And you know what you don't get if you drill in Japan? You don't get oil. You don't get oil. So they've got to get oil some way. Now, where are they going to get oil? They can get oil from, from us, but if they can't get oil from us, and that's not dependable because the United States has got a hand on the spit, right? And can turn the valve anytime it wants which means Japan and his whole war effort is dependent on the United States, or it can get it from, dust, dust right. from the dust you did, from what is now Indonesia. You know, you can get oil from one of the two places, you know, and the Japanese make a calculated risk. Now, if, if they're getting it from the Dutch East Indies, their tankers are going to be sailing right through what? Right by the Philippines. Right by the Philippines. See, if we didn't acquire the Philippines, we... Japanese with the bomb Pearl Harbor, right. they didn't care. Wouldn't have cared about us at Pearl Harbor, but the fact that we're in the Philippines, we still have what? Our hand on the valve. We could cut off shipping those tankers anytime we want. So the Japanese have to do what? Take the Philippines. They have got to take the Philippines. They have got to take Which also works into a broader strategy. Because the Japanese are working on an anti-imperialist strategy in Asia. You know, Asia the Asia East, for Asia. Asia for Asians. The East Asian Co Prosperity Zone. This is going to be Asia for Asians. We're going to get the Europeans and the Americans out of Asia. Self determination, just like Wilson said. You know, big appeal in America, a lot of propaganda directed at African Americans. You know, because we are your brothers. It isn't the white guy. You know, he's the one that's been dumping on them. You trust us, because this is what we're doing in Asia. What makes it difficult is what are the Japanese doing in Asia? Killing, killing. Man, they're killing Chinese right and left. You know, they are they, they are really rough. And what they've done in, in Korea is horrible. You know, so they don't have a lot of respect for, or don't demonstrate a lot of respect for fellow Asians, but that becomes their message. We are getting the white people out of Asia so that Asians can take charge of the Japanese can stick up. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things they do in the Philippines is once the Americans are out, they set up a Filipino government. Independent Philippines. Right? President and all in the Philippines. See, the Americans didn't do that. 
but we, your Japanese brothers, did. And so that's what Jap Japan is trying. At the end of the war, they do the same thing in, in Vietnam. They set up an independent and reestablished the Vietnamese Empire in, uh, in Vietnam in 1945. Absolutely. You know, they're going to officially finally take it away from the French, you know, and set up an independent government. Okay, so there, this is what's happening. Got it, you got to take, you got to control the Philippines. Well, to control the Philippines, you got to push the United States American fleet out of Hawaii. Got to push them out of Hawaii. Got to get them out of Guam. Got to get them out of Wake. Got to get them out of Guam. You know, and once they're, once the fleet is in San Francisco, man, the United States isn't going to be able to mess with the Philippines anymore, right? Yeah, Interesting strategy. You know, Japanese felt they needed to do it to to win. Okay. Anyway, war, what happens in the war? Yeah, we yay, yay! We win! Woo! Woo! Okay. Now we're not gonna we're not gonna we we international, so we're fighting with our allies. From the United States perspective, and until recently, we're not gonna go back to an isolationist idea or stay home idea, although there are folks that are promoting that after the war. We need Atomic bomb, boom, we've got Cold War, how do things change the day the Germans surrender? How do things change the day the Germans surrender? So All of a sudden, we got a new enemy. The Soviets become our enemy instead yeah. of our ally. Yeah, they, they move in 24 hours from being our loyal ally for which we will sacrifice anything to being our arch mortal enemy for which we will sacrifice anything to defeat. <coughs> 24 hours, boom, everything changes. You know, and, and it does. And what, what are some of the characteristics of this Cold War? What do we see happening during this idea where we have a bipolar world? Bipolar because we've got how many poles? Two poles. Two. two. A Skazinski and a Borshewitz. <laughs> no, no, we've got two poles, right? We've got on one hand, We've got the Soviet Union. On the other hand, we've got USA. the USA. We've got you know capitalism versus Soviet socialism. You know, so we got these two poles, right? You know, and that's the way the world is. And it doesn't matter. Everybody on the red side is, and you know what? They all wear the same T-shirts. They all cheer for the same team. They all love each other. Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody on and everybody on our side. Because you got the rich. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. Capitalists. Like Ferdinand Marcos, a great promoter of democracy. Oh, right? Yeah. 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 General Chu in South Vietnam, a promoter of democracy. Yeah, he's in Argentina. Somoza. Oh yeah. Boy, these are the guys we want to be close to, right? Because they're good Democrats. Shang <laughs> Kai Shek. Shang Kai Shek! Oh, yeah, because he's open now. He's such a guy. Yes, that's what we end up doing. So, if they're either on their side or our side, neither one have both sides, I should say, both sides have some very unsavory people who could care less about ideology. But, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And if you got two sides, you got to be on one or the other. But the thing was, on that side they had two of the most despicable people that ever lived. Joseph Stalin and Absolutely. 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 Yeah. You know, so you, you end up with these two sides. Neither one really understand the other. Both of them absolutely terrified of the other. You know, in this hugely expensive race, the United States decides we cannot continue to spend this kind of money. You know, and so we adopt a policy under Eisenhower we talked about last time called MAG, which is first Truman said we're going to contain communism. We're not going to roll it back or accept it. We're going to adopt a policy called MAD, which is mutually assured destruction, which means if you everybody dies, everybody dies. You, the first bullet that goes across that line. Massive retaliation. Massive retaliation. 
<coughs> if you want to bet your future, take the first shot. Take the first shot. And then everything we've got is going to be lost. Everybody loses. Everybody. <laughs> it, is, it is a doomsday machine. This is a doomsday. This is the game. We're playing that. And it does it work? Yeah. Well, yes. Oh, it does. Oh, we have it. We're still here. You know, so it works. You know, it, it works. We never had. We've only we've only had two atomic weapons used in warfare. You know, so it it worked. You know, they didn't use theirs. We didn't use ours. Even though both sides were tempted at different places. You know, but we didn't do it. Why? Because we knew the other side was going to retaliate, retaliate massively. Now we had enough. We had enough weapons to destroy the world. Like. Hundreds of times. Well, we, you know, that's what we were saying last time. You know, we, we, we have so much. You know, our nuclear arsenal is so great. We are targeting, you know, sending five, you know, warheads to detonate over Moscow. How many do you need? One. one? <laughs> you know, one? Yeah, right. You yeah, know, but you send, you detonate another four, and you make the radioactive rubble <laughs> shake. But that's all you're doing. But we've got so much. You know, we've got to, and we feel we've got to do it because they've got all kinds of people. And we know, you know, the Russians, geez Louise, they're going to kill millions of them. You know, if we're in a conventional war with the Russians, we got real problems. You know, because the Russians will pour all kinds of mind power into a fight. We're not going to do that. We're not going to lose millions of people in a war. You know, so we you, we got to have something to, to use. And and because we're in a bipolar world, it works, right? Because we only have to deal with one enemy, right? It's only one. Now, some people get, understand that this is simplistic, like Richard Nixon, you know, who was a sharp guy, uh, had all kinds of other problems, but was really sharp, and recognized he could play the Russians off against China. The Chinese, so he could he could kind of play them off against one another, which he does, you know, and does it really, really. Everybody well. else thought that they were all the same. Absolutely. When, it, when in fact they were two different enemies. They they <laughs> they each hated the other worse than they hated us. You know, they really did, and so he he exploits that. All right, what ends up changing everything? What now we've got this nice, and you know it. I don't know about y'all. I remember when I was in school, we had air raid. I told you before. Oh, yeah. There was an air raid site. Duck and cover. Yeah, outside our school. In the playground. Was it because I lived in the military town, North Virginia was a military town. And and there was a big air raid uh, tower on our playground, Crossroads Elementary, surrounded by a fence, barbed wire around the top. Tested it every Saturday, nine o'clock. Every Saturday. And we live about a mile away, and you could hear it. I mean, you could hear it clear. And every Saturday, 9 o'clock, you test it. And so every Saturday, 9 o'clock, we were made aware of that. When I was in a school, the nuns had a supply closet with things we need in case of a war. I had to bring the toilet paper. Well, you, <laughs> you, you were probably, probably the most valuable person. I brought the toilet paper. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. You what. If, I, if, you wanna, if you want to know about living through the nuclear age. I lived in Las Vegas, Nevada when I was a kid in the 50s. And I never did it. I'm sorry that I didn't. My dad used to tell me, you want to get up tomorrow morning and watch a nuclear test go off? You could see off in the, in the distance at about 4 o'clock in the morning there'd be a mushroom come out. So he's talking about Whoa. The, whole, the whole horizon would light up. Wow. See, it was just, it was, you know, it was just a couple hundred miles away. Well, you know, it, it, I remember in, in elementary school, in the 60s, and, and we talked about it, and we talked about it. You know, yes. what would you do if you heard the siren? Anytime other than 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. Because that meant we had how much time? We had 20 minutes. We had 20 minutes before Norfolk would be vaporized. Because they had five warheads on Washington, they also had five warheads on the largest naval base on the East Coast, sure. American naval base on the East Coast. You know, so we were going to be vaporized in 20 minutes. 
So I'm sure they were going to vaporize Pittsburgh with all the steel. Yeah, Pittsburgh with all the steel. What, what, what do we go? What and do you do? What, what do you do? You know, you're going to go under your desk. That's not going to help. My my school was a bomb shelter. You know, they had the civil defense, that yellow and black civil defense thing. Well, Norfolk, if you've ever been to Norfolk, the groundwater is so stupid high, you, nobody has basements. You can't have a basement in Norfolk because you have water. You know, so nobody has basement. Everything is above ground. And so we were, and Amory is, building above ground. You know, geez Louise, what would you do? What would you do? Would you try to get away? Would you? And, and we're talking, we're not talking about saying this to adults. We're talking about 10 year olds talking about this in class. What do you do when, and it could happen in an instant, any time, 20 minutes later, everything's gone. You wouldn't even be able to get home. 20 minutes, everything. You'd probably be better off if you died. No question. That's, you know, <laughs> that was kind of the conclusion. Because you'd never get away. You know, you'd never be able to get away. And, okay, so what, what ends up changing this? Frightening yet secure bipolar world. Follow the Soviet Union. Follow the Soviet Union. Soviet Union collapses. Remember, Reagan. Go, that's Reagan right. Reagan, Reagan, Reagan did something nobody else had the guts to do. He outspent. He outspent. You know, he kept on raising every hand. He would raise them. You know, until the Russians had to fold because they just couldn't. They, they just couldn't do it anymore. They, they just couldn't. Couldn't call. They couldn't call. Them because they didn't have the money. So he just, that's what he did. Now, what did it do to the United States? Our debt went, boom! Where did we get the money? Oh, from China, from Japan, from other places. So we spent an enormous amount, and we're still dealing with debt, we will forever, you know, that, that we got during the 80s, when Reagan just outspent them. So it wasn't like he was playing with house money. You know, he was barring, he was writing IOUs to get the money. We just had better credit than the Soviets. You know, so we outspent them. Soviet Union collapses. Our world is a much better place, right? Nah. No, <laughs> no, it isn't. And that's what we're going to talk about. What, what are we going to, what do we face now as the United States? And what happens after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union? Now, how did the, what, what, we, we know that the Soviet Union wasn't able to match American military spending, right? right? Wasn't able to match military spending. What, what happened during this? When I mean, we're looking at the early, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, what ends up happening, what do we see as the Soviet Union begins to, say the Soviet bloc begins to crack? What were some things that led up to that? Berlin Wall down. Oh, okay, well, we have the Berlin Wall. What happens even before that? Poland becomes independent. Okay, we end up with a, even before Poland, because remember, Poland becomes independent. <coughs> remember, we talked, when we looked at last year, 1968, you know, you'd have these little, little outbreaks. 1954 or 56, Hungary, we got 68, we got Czechoslovakia. You have these little moves, independent. You know, to break away from the bloc, the, the Soviet bloc. And those are always what? They're always suppressed. The leaders become convinced that, that Soviet socialism is the way to go. You know, so it's by reason, you know, right? Just like everywhere else. Yeah, just like everywhere else. You know, so they become convinced of the right path. So we end up getting little cracks, but they were, Soviets were always able to push them down. Push them down. Were always able to maintain control, and they did it not only by themselves, but by sending in tanks. Yes, yeah, sending in tanks and tanks from other Eastern Bloc, Warsaw Pact countries. I mean, it wasn't just Soviet tanks rolling into Czechoslovakia in 1968. What other countries were sending in tanks? Poland was sending in tanks. Hungary was sending in tanks. You know, the countries that bordered. Uh, Czechoslovakia, they were all backing the Soviets. So you'd have one country resist and the rest of the bloc stand firm. But when we start getting into the 80s, things start to begin to change. As money is being sucked out of the Soviet economy, which is precarious anyway, to fuel a more expensive military. And the Soviet Union has also gotten involved in some adventures which was probably not profitable. 
probably not a great idea. You know, when you if you look at the a map of the 1970s, where you have Soviet states popping up, the Soviets appear to be incredibly successful in the 1970s. Soviet communism seems to be, you know, on a rise. If you look politically at the world map, you look at Egypt. They were building. You look at Egypt. You know, becomes far more accommodating in Syria, far more accommodating to the Soviets. The Soviets have become the leader of this third, of the, almost the leader of the third world, and you're ending up in places like Mozambique and uh, and uh, Angola fighting imperialist powers. You know, they they are doctrinally Soviet communists. You know, other nations in Africa. You know, Vietnam becomes appears to be. You know, a significant factor, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, you know, all of them are, are now Soviet communists. It looks like they're riding high, and that's why Henry Kissinger is saying in the 70s, we've got to be real careful because Soviet communism seems to be on a rise, and we may be, we may be overwhelmed by a system that he considered more efficient than Western capitalism because it was controlled. You know, it was a controlled system. So they could divert resources wherever they wanted. They seem to be on the ascendancy, right? Until they get involved in a place that is, has been the, the graveyard of Afghanistan. all powers. Afghanistan. 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 Yep. You know, anybody who wants to be involved in Afghanistan, any nation, has lost its collective mind. Because Afghanistan is a nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what are some powers that got sucked into Afghanistan? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great! My gosh, he gets sucked into Afghanistan. You know, ends, ends the expansion, Greek expansion. Who else gets sucked into Afghanistan? British. The British get sucked into Afghanistan. Because they got to protect you from the, from the Russian Empire. You know, this is protecting India. They get sucked in to Afghanistan. Soviets get sucked into Afghanistan. Set up a Soviet Soviet system is set up. They become a, a, a people's republic in Afghanistan. They were but, there for what, 20 years? Not not quite yeah. 20 years, but but close, like 15 you know, you know, years or so. Like us. But but it's a, it becomes a Soviet, you know, kind of a Soviet sat not a Soviet satellite. The problem is Afghanistan is ethnically all kinds of divided. And confused and politically, you've got these language groups and all kinds of things, to, and plenty of places to hide. Oh yeah, the and top oh, order is oh, disgusting. Jeez, <laughs> oh, we, it, it is a nightmare, and the Soviets end up getting mired in this the same sort of thing for the same sort of reason we ended up getting mired in Vietnam, because you control the roads, the highways, you control the cities and the highways, but the country is out of control. You know, when you get past the highway, you don't control anything. You know, you may send a little, you, you send your helicopters and attack a place here and, and win a resounding victory. Look at Vietnam, we never lost the battle. Jeez Louise, we won everything. The trouble is, the trouble is, once we left the battlefield, they came back, you know, the, the VC came back in. You know, because we were fighting a civil war, you know. So we're not able to hold territory outside of cities. And that's the what difference between, between, the between the Soviets and us was that they didn't have anybody marching to the streets against the war in Afghanistan. Okay. We had to well, well, it became really a popular well, well, you know, it becomes white and and from the American, we don't know what's happening. The Soviets keeping a tight control well, of the news, but we know that. The uh, same thing that happened to us in Vietnam, one of the issues isn't the fact that our boys are dying, which is a big deal, yes. but what are we doing? <laughs> Flushing what? Money down a toilet. Toilet. And that's what the Soviets are doing in Afghanistan. Flushing money down a toilet. It is what? Disappearing. Because you're spending it on troops and military supplies instead of spending it on washing machines, you know, and frozen dinners, and TV sets. And that's the trouble with the controlled economy, 
you know, the Russians, since the Soviets control the economy, they are making an intentional decision to shift resources to the military, not only to match what Reagan is spending, but also to continue to maintain this war in Afghanistan and shifting it away from consumer goods because they're controlling the economy. Outside of the inefficiencies in the system, it is an intentional shift, right? And the people get people get because I want a new washing machine. Yeah, I, I want an iPhone. I want what you got in the <laughs> Yeah, I want what you got in the You want, I, I want to get an iPhone. You know? Maybe well, I'm not, not that bad. Been invented. You know, I want one of those little beepers that you carry on your belt. Yeah. You know? Uh, that, but, but, I want a short way. I want a TV. I want a TV. All right? So we end up, we end up with dissatisfaction with that. And the Soviet Union, both China, yeah. I was, in 1973, in the spring, I was in Afghanistan. Six oh. weeks later, the king was up the story. And that's when the whole thing started. Again. When I was there, they were still sending camel caravans to China. Okay, the people you could see on right? Every ethnic group in Asia walking out that city. It was quite an experience. It, 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 a, a, a really interesting place. Yeah, and they, they do have a king. Yeah. You know, they had the king into the 70s. He was more like a constitutional monarch. There, there were power groups underneath him, but he, he was kind of a symbolized that held them all together. But, but the, and underneath him, these ethnic groups, they don't like each other at oh, all. Right. You know, they're always contending with one another, these little ethnic groups, and they've got their tribal tribal leaders and their little, you know, warlords and their little <laughs> mini armies. The same sort of stuff that was wandering right. around China. You know, before the the uh, the Chinese Revolution, Civil War. We also helped yeah, Afghan secretly, <coughs> or not too secretly. The Mush Muhajadin. Right. Yeah. Yes, we're supplying them Some with all. Because they killed themselves. Yeah. yeah, and that's good. Yeah. 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 Well, it's good. There was a paved road that ran from one side of the east boundary of Afghanistan to Iran. Half of it was built by the Russians and half of it was built by the United States. Wow. <coughs> <coughs> Soviet Union can't do it anymore. It just, just can't do it anymore. Now, interesting, what they, they take a strategy that's different. Neither the Soviets or the Chinese can sustain this thing. And they, they make a, both of them make a calculated decision, but just the opposite. And maybe what the Soviets decide is is what not to do. What the Chinese decide to do is maybe what to do if you want to maintain control but change and need it. The Soviets make the other choice. Chinese decide to loosen up the economy but maintain the political. The Soviets decide to not loosen up the economy but to loosen up political and allow more voices, more information to go into the Soviet Union. You know, as more people have a voice and into the Soviet bloc, the people start saying what? We don't want to be here. What? We don't want to be here. Estonia, the singing revolution. Yeah, we don't want to be here. We we do not want to be Soviets. Soviets. We don't want to be Soviets anymore. And it first starts happening outside, you said Poland, where the workers, which, you know, the Soviet is the... Soviet Union is a workers' paradise. Uh -huh. Who ends up protesting? The, Gdansk. the workers in Gdansk. The, the workers start protesting. But this isn't the, you know, we're not getting. And this has to do with consumer goods. You know, it has to do with money. You know, it's, it, you, people have money. They just don't have anything to spend it on. You know, which is crazy. They got it, they can't spend it. Because there's nothing to buy. And this, this system has got needs to change. Communication is becoming easier, you know, and it's harder to limit communication. So you start having these little outbreaks in the countries around. And first it's the polls, you know, and the, the checks. And of course Romania's always been kind of crazy. You know, they've been going their own way for a while. They don't want to be in the Soviet bloc. Yugoslavia was there for a while. You know, they don't want to be in the Soviet bloc anymore. So you end up getting this breakdown of first of the Soviet bloc and then of the Soviet Union. But as the Soviet Union collapses, what rises? From the, from the dust 
of the Soviet Union. Russia. All those little countries. All those little countries. So we got Poland, we got Estonia, we got Latvia, we got Kyrgyzstan, we've got you know Uzbekistan, we got stands running around Asia right now. Right? We got stands everywhere. Right? And everybody is, is happy, but out of the out of the smoke of the collapse of the Soviet Union, we've got the rise of something within the Soviet, the old Soviet Union. Russia. And that's what? The Russian Federation. The Russian Federation, which, if you look at a map of the old Soviet Union, it would be like, if it was the United States, they'd be one state that covers everywhere from New York to California, and then you got a bunch of southern states. Right. You know? You know, so the Russian Federation ends up rising out of the out of the rubble. Okay, one more, let's one more point, and then take a break. Oh, okay, okay. Oh. we got we got no we got a different world, right? You know, we got the in the old days, the United States and the Soviet Union could do we all have little client powers, right? You know, we got the Philippines as ours, Nicaragua as ours, you know, South Vietnam, Vietnam is ours. And, and we can keep the leaders, China, you know, nationalist China's out. We can keep those leaders. They were kind of crazy, you know, kind of wild. We can keep them on with a the short leash, leash, right? Because, you know, if they do too much, what are we going to do? We're going we're gonna to cut them off. And, and since most of our, the people, these guys that we're supporting, you know, the bad guys, we're supporting a lot of good guys, a lot of good guys. But we're supporting some kind of bad guys. They are shipping their country to Switzerland. You know, they're shipping the resources of their country to their own bank accounts in Switzerland. We know it. They know it. You know, so we're going to say, we're going to cut you off. And they say, we're not going to do that. You know, we're, we'll, we'll play by your rules. And the Soviets are doing the same thing, right? They don't think the last thing they want is mutual assured destruction, right? So they're not going to let their little clients go too far because they don't want to vaporize the Soviet Union because of Mozambique has gotten frisky with South Africa. You know, they don't want to risk, you know, the entire world. So they could keep Mozambique on a short leash, right? Angola. They're not going to mess around in Southwest Africa. They're going to keep them on a short leash. Once the Soviet Union collapses and we are the only guys in town, all these little powers, they start doing what? Everything they wanted to do before. Because now the restraints are off. Now the restraints are off. And we end up, what happens between Iraq and Iran? What does Iraq and Iran immediately do? Go to war. Go to war. They immediately go to war. Why do they go to war? Who knows? Who knows? They're crazy! <laughs> no, that's, that's not fair. One and, and, and I'll tell you, I'm pulling back on that because one of the things, I'm kind of kidding, one of the things I think Americans, we tend to do this a lot. We end up labeling people who do things that we don't like or think is crazy. We label them what? Crazy. Crazy! crazy. So I'm saying, he's crazy! They're not crazy. You know, they're not crazy at all. They know exactly what they're doing. You know, we don't want them to do it, but they know what they're doing. The problem is that the Middle East was carved out by the British and the French and the nations that just didn't work because it, it, everybody was loyal to their ethnic group or their tribe. And you ended up with Shias and Shiites and together you end up with the Kurds without a nation. And, and that is still simmering from that oh, yeah. now, situation. When you say Kurds, Shia, and Sunni, mm -hmm. when you use those three groups, what nation are you talking about? There's one nation in the Middle East that would be the poster child for Kurds, Sunni, and Shia. Iraq. Iraq, Iraq, well Turkey's got the problem with the Kurds, but Iraq, majority Shia, Governed by Sunnis, Sunnis with Kurds, Kurds in the north, yeah. you know. And by the way, Kurds in the north, closest to Turkey. Russia. Yeah, Russia, Turkey, true. Also closest to oil well. They got all the oil. Yeah, they got the closest to the oil. 
you know, which gives everybody wealth. So we got Saddam Hussein governing a country that shouldn't exist because it makes no reasonable sense to exist. <clears throat> Who's ambitious? Really ambitious. He's also a roach. He's also a roach. And a roach is a survivor. He is a survivor. But he's a he's ambitious. So he starts he starts a war with a country he seems to think is so disorganized they couldn't put an army in the field if they wanted to. Iran. Iran. Yeah, yeah you're right, but that's later. He starts a war with Iran because he believes after the revolution, Iran is a basket case. Their military, just like the Soviets before World War II, have been purged so much and made it ideologically pure. Man, it, this is good. And he's got all this weaponry from the United States because we have been his sponsor, you know, in the Middle East. He's got all this good American weaponry and the Soviets have all, uh, the, the, the Iranians have old American weapons, you know, that have been in disrepair. You know, wasn't, wasn't this the situation off. that after World War II, they went in and they found all this oil in the Middle East, and the American companies exploited the hell out of this stuff, and all of a sudden there's money pouring into these places. Absolutely. That's, that may just throw things off kilter, and, and, and the problem is the, the money never got spread out to the common guy. Nope. It was all sucked up by these people, these, these Shaws and yeah, who's sending who's sending the wealth to Switzerland? Right. And before those places were all their Middle East was a bunch of bunch of Arabs running around in the sand, nobody cared about. Them. Yeah. Now yeah, they, they got they oil, they still, got money. There's still big conflict between those, all those groups. Oh, absolutely. Oh, they're all absolutely. absolutely. But, but, but Western, the money amplifies. Western Western interest. West, the West becomes interested because of oil. Because of oil. Yeah. You know, late 19th century. And that's, that's when the British start getting interested. Carved up after the First World War. Yeah. yeah. One thing to one thing to hate, thing to hate your neighbor is another thing to ha hate your neighbor and have enough money to buy some really nasty weapons to finish <laughs> him off. What happened? What happens in this war with Iran? Stand still. Yeah, that's it. Stalemate. Yeah. The the Iraqis miss underestimate the will of the Iranians to fight. They really do. And the and the skill of the army. And it becomes a stalemate. And it becomes a Bloody stalemate. Bloody stalemate. What year it, was this? This would have been, um, let's see, no, 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 no. would have been late, uh, would have been like between 85, 80, yeah, 89. Because once this war ends, so I read. That was after the fall of the Shah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Shah is long since gone. This is, no. this is long enough for the, for the revolution, right. the Iranian revolution, to purge. You know all the Shah's leadership, so they purged yeah, they the army. They didn't you like know. that Western. Empire. Well, yeah, that's right. And you eliminate. So you, but Iraq, Saddam Hussein is still an ambitious person. You know, he he isn't able to expand into Iraq, Iran. So he then decides to expand into Kuwait, right? Which triggers a, a, a bad a bad scene, right? Where. American troops and weaponry are shooting at American weaponry. Yeah, you know, true. are shooting at you know one another. Uh, so you end up with a with a with something entirely different. So we've got instability in the area. Take a little break. Let's let's come back because we want to finish this and and look into the future a little bit. All right. So we'll pick up a little bit of speed. The uh, so we've got we. Now these are international things that draw in the United States. Certainly Iran and Iraq, you know, we, we get drawn in because we are heavily supporting in that war. We are heavily supporting Iraq in, in the war that fighting with Iraq. You know, even to the point where we were talking about wars, the Americans, we see them, and, and this, this is probably a good thing, probably a good thing, but it's unique for us. The, the wars we fight, we need to have a more war. To fight. We tend to have more. We have to feel as though we are fighting for democracy, democracy, justice, freedom. We need to have a moral reason for war. That's even though most wars are fought for territory, money, power, or or reason to resist. The set. Usually, we need to give a having moral reason for doing it. And you know.
Saddam Hussein, we promoted in the 80s as a bulwark, a protector against this radical Iranian Islamist con idea. And so we are, we are, he's standing in the breach. So we're sending a lot of military equipment in his, and, and he was an aggressor in the war with Iraq, you know. But we're supporting him because, again, he's one of our guys. You know, and this is before the fall of the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union is, is messed up in Afghanistan, but they're also sending equipment to Iran because they're fighting our guy in Iran. Oh, it's a mess. Uh, so when, when the Soviet Union collapses, you know, his interests become shift, and within five years, you know, he becomes our arch enemy because he's invaded Kuwait, and, and we're engaged in a war there, and it's a mess. Uh, the, Yugoslavia, you remember Yugoslavia, because uh, the Soviet Union is not the only place it breaks up, also Yugoslavia. And what makes the breakup of Yugoslavia so messy? Civil war. You end up with the civil war. Why do we end up with the civil war in Yugoslavia? Religion. Ethnic, 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 ethnic which is tie, also tied to religion. Because you've got Roman Catholic Croats, Versus you know, Orthodox. Versus all Orthodox Serbs, Serbs versus Muslim, Muslim Bosnians. Right. And and so you've got it is you know, it looks three. You got three different groups. And when you look at the Bosnian Civil War, <laughs> my gosh, it's crazy in the nineties. It's crazy. Because you've got you've got the Bosnian Muslims, you know, they have a little federation and they've got an army, but within there you've got the Serb Republic as part of the, uh, it's part of Bosnia Herzegovina, and they've got an army, and you've got the Croats, and they got an army. And, and we can't just stay out of there. We have to send people. We'll be, or, it, it, we'll, to you, you and you get and you get this shifting Nobody alliances where you've got these and and all of these little armies except the Bosnians, the Croats and the the Serbs, they're a little proxy. You know, these are armies that are being supported by Serbia, but supported by Croatia. In the Second World War, though, the, the Croats and the, the Muslims stayed with Germany, yes. and the Orthodox went with, went with the West. Went with the West. And, and with the old Yugoslavia, when, when Yugoslavia was constructed as a state after World War I, it, you know, it, it, it had been different countries ruled by you know, different powers. I mean, Austria controlled a great deal. Uh, Croatia, which is Roman Catholic, and Bosnia, but you have the Serbs, but you also have Montenegro, and you've got well, like Albanian. They're manufacturing these countries, and they don't work well, out. You know, the 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 name Yugoslavia means the kingdom of Yugoslavia. You know what it means? It means the kingdom of the southern Slavs. That's what it means. Yugoslavia means the kingdom of the when it was the kingdom of Yugoslavia, it was the kingdom of the southern Slavs. Uh, and the first, initially the name, uh, what was it? They, it was the kingdom of, of Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia. You know, it, it listed these groups. And, and changed, you know, after the war, 1920, you know, to the kingdom of the southern Slavs. So it was a, an amalgamation then held together by a Serbian monarch because King Peter was a Serbian monarch ruling Surly Croatians and Muslims like that. and Montenegrins, you know, as well as Albanians, after the war splits up where the Croatian state becomes, you know, and, and that becomes interesting too, because the Croatian state in World War uh, two is allied with Germans, with the Germans and the Italians and, and when the Italians drop out, they continue to be allied with the Germans. You know, because they get Italian mm -hmm. territory. The Italians were ruling along the Dalmatian, Dalmatian coast. But, you know, so they become, and they are flying the same flag, national flag they use now. And the Croatian fascists during the war were not kind and gentle fascists. You know, they were shipping, they were notorious for shipping Jews to concentration camps and really coming down on uh, Orthodox Serbs within the Croatian state. So, I mean, it, it gets really interesting when you think about somebody whose grandfather 
was persecuted by the Croats during World War II, looking up and seeing the Croatian flag being the flag of this Nazi state during World War II. It's like, you know, somebody in Germany looking up and seeing a swastika flying over a, a, a national building. Hey, because it's the same flag. It's that, that checkerboard flag. When I worked at Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel, I worked at a, in an electrical gang, and I had guys of Serbian uh, descendancy and Croats. Uh-oh. Oh, I hate oh my I hate it. It was too late. And, and then after and they the didn't war, even live there. you know, after the war, when the, when the Serbs, after the Croats had been dumping on the Serbs during the war, after the war was over, the Serbs are looking at as a, the opportunity to settle a few, few schools. Uh, and that's what they end up doing. It's, it's a horrible, horrible situation in in Yugoslavia. And what ends up holding Yugoslavia together? Tito. 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 Just like the monarchy <laughs> held it together, Tito holds it together. When Tito goes, has a question. Yeah. I just went to uh, Riga, Latvia. Okay. And during the war, they killed all their own Jews. There's a, now a memorial and everything. So all the countries within were probably either sending the Jews to Auschwitz or wherever, or they would kill their own. Oh, absolutely. Lithuania was notorious for, for, for coming down in, uh, on, on Jewish population and, and anybody else they wanted to come down on. Well, you, you, you were Lithuanian. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was, yeah. 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 The only one that didn't send you to the camps was Bulgaria. The Orthodox leader of Bulgaria said he was in front of the train. To ruin everything. The Bulgarians weren't going to get away with it, but they did not do that. The Bulgarians, the other people that didn't, and it wasn't. Crucial, but the Finns didn't eat. Right. You know, the Finns didn't send Jews to the concentration. And you know, when you look at the end of the war, the Bulgarians were the ones that turned first. They also didn't. And the Bulgarians really interesting in World War Two because they also they were the they were the only ones of the the um, uh, what do they call it? It's not the I. The, uh, I, I the, it it becomes the Axis, the but it's a, it's a word for the broader thing. Axis. What, they, what the Bulgarians mm -hmm. didn't send troops to fight the Russians, didn't participate in Barbarossa. All the other ones did, including Spain sent a division to fight in Russia. But good night. Italy sent an army to fight in Russia, but uh, the Bulgarians didn't because they didn't want to fight the Slavic brothers. And Hitler let them let them do it. Of course, the Bulgarians were dumping on the Greeks. You know, they were <laughs> occupying big hunks of Greeks. Anyway, we got this awful, awful, awful civil war. 100,000 people died in this Bosnian civil war. And, and you've got these three armies, and sometimes the Bosnians and the Croats are fighting the Serbs. Sometimes the Bosnians are fighting the Croats and the Serbs. Some, it, it is, it, you know, you've got these shifting alliances. Horrible, horrible thing. What ends up, what do we end up doing? Again, moral reasons. You know, you know, NATO ends up becoming involved and we end up bombing the heck out of Serbian positions, you know. But then the Serbians are massacring Bosnians and shipping them to different places. Uh -huh. You know, and nothing's worse than ethnic religious war. So, but but this is this is now in the post. 9-11? Yes. Jeez yes. Louise, 9-11 changes everything. everything. You know, but this is the new world. When it was too when we knew our enemy, yes. it was easy, right? Yes. We were we didn't like the Russians. You don't trust them. Right. But now we live in a different kind of world, right? Mm -hmm. We don't like have an enemy. You don't trust anybody. And you don't you can't trust anyone. Your enemy is American citizens. That well that's exactly that's exactly right. And then we engage and this may be this may be I think you know sort of the the term for the uh, the, the new millennium. 
uh, you know, war, the war on terror. And, and I find that just fascinating because it's not a war against somebody. It's a war fear against the fear of or an idea. A, yeah, an idea or a feeling. How do you fight a feeling? A, a feeling. You got to get inside somebody's mind. Yeah, I mean, you how, can't do that. How do you know when you win? You know, nobody's afraid anymore. You know what does that what does that mean? You know, and and I think the ambiguity of of this, the, even that word, kind of puts explains where we are as we enter this new millennium. You know, we're fighting a war, and, and we've done it before. We fought war on poverty. You know, we fought the war on drugs. You know, we did that, and that sounds great. But now we've even taken it a step further. We are fighting a war against a, an emotion. You know? Hatred. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like a fighting a war on hatred. You know, okay, we win when nobody hates anybody. <laughs> You know, that means how many collard greens? You know, I, do, do, I mean, we, do we win when I feel comfortable walking to certain neighborhoods, you know, completely at peace, then we, we won the war? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what that means. But it's that ambiguity that, yes, it becomes a never-ending war. We will never, this will never, ever, ever end. We are always going to be fighting a war on terror. Always. We always have, you know. With all the Syrian refugees and all these other countries, that's, that's going to, there's going to be more form, there's always going to be more format from all these displaced persons. And I don't know how they're ever, ever going to put it back together. And we'll always have to have some sort of, we always probably will have some degree of involvement in all this. Well, you know, and in the old days, and maybe we're looking at, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, uh, maybe we're looking at a new old days. <laughs> you know, when, when it was two, old days. two worlds, east, west, and one of the two is going to fix it. You know, and, and they're going to make fix it by supporting whoever's in charge, sending them a lot of military equipment, and keeping control of the population. You know, so we're not going to have issues like that. But now that we're in a new, new and strange place, you know, the, the Bush doctrine, which you know comes out of this 9/11 visit, what's the Bush doctrine? That we don't follow anymore. But what was the Bush doctrine? Really, an interesting thing coming out of coming out of 9/11 and the, the second Gulf War, that the United States has a an inherent right to promote democracy around the world. That it is our right to promote the American democratic system around the world. And if it meant intervening before a war breaks out, that's what we have a right to do. We have the right to preemptively become involved or even preemptively attack if we think that it will promote democratic principles in another place. Or Halliburton. Well, but I mean, that's not what he's saying. The, the, the Bush doctrine is it promotes democratic principles. And, and that's the, that was the Bush doctrine. Somebody that said, you know, it means we're involved, becoming involved all the time. That's the Bush doctrine. We're going to become involved everywhere all the time. And the problem is, we learned applying the Bush doctrine that we, we can't, well, we can't do it. We, we, we can't be do the it. savior of everybody. We, we, we cannot intervene in everywhere. <laughs> in fact, we are having a we had a horrible time intervening in Vietnam. In, in, well, in Vietnam, but yeah. under the Bush doctrine, we had a horrible time intervening in two places. In Afghanistan, Afghanistan and in Iraq. Well, you that know, we we had a whole we stretched our resources you know, really thin in two places. But, but some people, I mean, we're trying to promote democracy in some places just aren't ready for that. Well, you know, while we were doing that, yes. Exactly, they don't want it. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had you. So uh, the, uh, you know, while this is happening, what's going on in Africa? Well, Rwandans are killing one another, yeah, right? They don't need each other. 
You know, and, and are we going to intervene in Rwanda? No. Uh, no. We're not going to intervene in Rwanda. Should we have re intervened in Rwanda? I don't know. A lot of Rwandans died. You know, if we're promoting democracy, maybe we should have. But we were so tied up in Iraq and Afghanistan, how do can it. we intervene in Rwanda? You know, the, the, you know the, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a basket case. Do we, we, do, do we intervene there? Well, the Bush doctrine said we can. Should we? I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. Okay, so we're in a world that where it's where it's far more uh, complex. And just as something, and, and neo-isolationism. Why do I include neo-isolationism at the end? Because that's where we live in. Because that's kind of what, you know, President <coughs> Trump ran on. You know, kind of a neo, and I call it neo-isolationism because it's not true isolationism. It's kind of a new spin on isolationism. What, what foreign policy, and this may be challenging, what, what foreign policy are we following now? Well, how would you describe, using polite language, <laughs> how would you describe American foreign policy now? Getting no. out of all international agreements. What's that? We're getting out of all international we're, agreements. We're, we're kind of breaking international agreements, so we're withdrawing <coughs> from agreements that we've already signed, right. which has questionable legality, but that's, that's neither here nor there. We're withdrawing from international agreements, Well, yeah, with the Bush, like with the Bush doctrine, the goal was democracy. We are promoters of democracy, and that was really easy. Now, what is, what, did it work? Maybe not. Maybe is it good? Maybe, maybe. Not. But it was clear. It's harder now. That's why I call it neo isolationism. We we really don't know where. We, we are now breaking relationships. We're withdrawing from international agreement, which that sounds a little isolation. What, what's happening with the sneakiness of China? Well, what's happening with China? What is moving <coughs> into African countries or moving into the Well, one of the things I think we're saying, hold that, hold that, because we're gonna that's what we're gonna talk about next. All right. So we're in a, we're in an odd time where the American role is one of the things I think we see is Withdrawing from international agreements. I mean, good gracious, what if this goes for withdrawing from NATO, which is sort of the, you know, that's kind of a, a hallmark, right. you know, for stability is since World War II. You know, there's all kinds of rumblings. You know, in the next next four years, if, if the president's reelected, I, I would expect us to be withdrawing from NATO. You know, we are we are that close from pulling out an all a lot of them, even major historical international organizations. So we're, we're withdrawing, and what's happening is when you withdraw, what, what is created? A vacuum. a vacuum. And as soon as a vacuum is created, what happens? Somebody tells us. And I think that's what we're having with China. In fact, that's what I'm saying here. We now live where in the Cold War, actually it's going back to a pre-World War II kind of world. That we don't live in a bipolar world, we live in a multi uh, where you've got not just two powers, but you've got a lot of powers that are all doing what? Well, because what do all countries do? All countries do. They want to be on top. They're looking after their self-interest. They all countries are looking after their self-interest. One of the things my grandfather, bless his heart, he had a sheet metal business. And he believed it when his workers, pay him, pay him. this was a this was a non-union shop, mm -hmm. uh, so he didn't pay him. But he always was mad. At My grandmother even more so was always irritated that when the workers came in for their paychecks, they didn't thank him. <laughs> they didn't thank him. Oh, for him. he was always irritated that they didn't thank him no, for their paychecks. Didn't. They you know, the work. And, and my father worked for him, and my father would tell him, they feel they earn what you pay them, and you don't pay them much. But they felt they, they, they gave you the labor, and they were getting what they deserved. And he was always irritated that they didn't thank, they weren't grateful. 
Everybody was, even, everybody, was, everybody was even every painting. Yes, yeah. that's right. But he, he didn't see it that way. He saw it as a personal, it was, he took it personal. I think historically, at least since World War II, Americans really struggle with the fact that we feel other countries should be grateful to us. We, they should be grateful for us, and therefore they should be willing to put aside their own self-interest for American self-interest. That, that they should be willing to pay more, or do more, or get a lower price, so that we can, so that we can profit, so we can benefit. And that's something we have a real hard, I think we have a hard time dealing with, maybe because we've been such a dominant power in the West for so long. We, we forget the fact that other countries are, are not going to be grateful for us, to us, for what we did in World War II. The French are not going to be eternally grateful for intervening in, in, for 1944. You know, the, um, the French are looking at their own self-interest. You know, they're not, they don't care about our self-interest. Only when it's in alignment. Only when the interests are alive. We're having a very difficult time of uh, getting hold of the fact that democracy will not prosper except in a society where principles are more important for people. Absolutely. Oh, got to get out. Yes. Oh, right, get a little round of applause. That's a good one. Yeah, I think, that, I, think that, I think you're exactly right. And, and democracy is going to have an even historical democracy, if you look at history. Even capitalism is going to have a really hard time functioning when there's a huge discrepancy between the top and the bottom. That undermines the very principles of, of democratic society and the very principles of capitalism when you have that huge, <coughs> huge gap. And we are, we are in that neighborhood now. We are going to have a hard time functioning as a democratic capitalist country if that gap between the richest and the poorest continue to expand. Amen. Yeah, we, it, it won't happen. It's not going to happen. Democracy, That's going to break down. Democracy has never really worked well unless you have a prosperous middle class. Absolutely. You, there's got to be a sense of equality. And there also has to be a sense by all members of society that mobility is possible. Once you lose, once you lose that sense that, that economic and social mobility is possible and you have perpetual underclasses, then you don't have a democracy. Democracy inevitably breaks down. And it's replaced by other things. But this, we live in a multipolar world. What are some of, we, the United States is certainly a power, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What other power, what are we, we are sharing, and, and for 20 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, we were the power. But that's certainly changing now. What would be some other countries that you would say are other? Obviously, China. you know, you would say China is, is, a, is one of those poles, right? You know, so in the future, whether we like it or not, we're gonna have to deal with the Chinese. Because they're not going to go anywhere. We still got the Russians. The Russians have reasserted themselves as as a power. Anybody that that possesses that match, that um, those Korea. nuclear weapons we are got power. North Korea, no, a little country. Yeah, well, and and we have helped contribute to that. We have now made North Korea. You know, our president, and it's not a criticism, says that North Korea is ready to step step up with the great nations. The South Korea, I don't know, but that's what he said. South you know, Korea. he is. They, they could be a great society. Yeah, maybe. Okay, but that's certainly a poll. What else? Who else is? You know, countries that you haven't even mentioned. India. In India. the future. My gosh, India. Second fastest growing economy in the world is India. You know, India is on the threshold of being a major major economic force in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't believe me, next time your computer breaks down, make a phone call. Oh <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I had a I had a professor, I was taking a class, and this was years and years ago. And it was a the professor was and I, I don't know, using software, some kind of software. It was to get recertified. You know, you have to when you're a teacher you have to get recertified. That was a class. And I remember talking to her after class because she was she was an American citizen. But she had three PhDs. Wow. Three PhDs. She, but was in, lived in, and was educated in India. And, and uh, I was talking to her just about the future, what she saw happening in the future. 
And she said, I, I have, even though I am a, an American, and I am a dedicated American, and now this is my country. And she was married to an American kid. And she said, but I'll tell you, I don't think the future looks good as an American. She says, and I'll tell you what, in America, we offer classes like this. Yeah. And I said, oh. She said, in America, we offer classes to teach people how to use software. Okay. In India, we have classes to teach people how to write software. Write software. Oh. And the, it's only a matter of time yeah, yeah. before There's the, the people who are writing it have the charge. Have the power. Oh. You know, you, you use technology. They make it. They we make, make it. Yeah. And she said, as an American, she, and, and she was not speaking as, oh, look at that, where are we going to be? She was an American. She said, that really worries me about the United States, that you are, we are users, we are not creators anymore. And, and I, whether she's right or not, I don't know. But you've, got, you've certainly got India as a power. I'll tell you, if you look at the Western Hemisphere, Brazil, Brazil is, 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 is becoming an economic power. It's, its economy is expanding. And no one should, no, no one should underestimate the ex economic expansion in Mexico, as well as the population expansion. We may talk about Mexicans like we, this is something we want to keep out, but they are having rapid economic growth. Their economic growth far faster than the United States. In, in Africa, you've got South Africa that's becoming really technologically sound. So we are looking at a world that has more than one <coughs> major. Yeah, pole. Yeah, right. there's more. And all of these countries are not saying to the United States, whatever you want. You know, we want to enter a new trade deal, and we know we're going to give you the best side of it. Oh, yeah. You know, because we just love you so much. Yeah, right. So take advantage of us. Right. You know, they're not doing that anymore. You know, they're not, we're not able to exert that kind of influence. On us. And that's a world we got to, and maybe, maybe the, with the president, you know, in the trade deals, and maybe Americans, we want to hold on to that. That we, you know, we're still living in a world where we can cut deals that help us and hurt them. But we live in a different world now. And we may not be able to make deals that automatically are good for us but bad for you, where you're going to give us a whole lot more than you're going to get. Maybe that's not the world anymore. You've never mentioned Canada. How does Canada sit in that? Well, they, we'll look at that in just a minute. One of the issues with Canada is population. Yeah. All of these other, all the other places I've mentioned have rapid population growth and have, have a population size enough to provide markets for their economy. The, the, the issue with Canada is always going to be population. You know, it's, it's always going to be population. Uh, and, and growth rate. The, the countries that I offered have high growth rates too, with the exception of China, but that's more from law than anything else. But we also don't want to end, uh, underestimate a European Union, you know, that has fractures but is also a force. Climate change. Gene, you said, big issue. Number one. Climate change. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, the, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, when I read the Secretary of State saying, well, it might be good. We're going to open up the Arctic as the ice starts melting. You know, we'll be able to push ships to the Arctic. Oh. Well, that's nice. We won't be bringing them to New York no. because it's going to be underwater, you know, or Miami because it won't exist anymore. But, but geez, be it'd be nice. We can build climate change. Now, you know, is it man-inspired? Is it natural? I don't care. It's changing the economy. The change it. So, you know, we're going to have to respond to it. We have to build a, a, a wall all around the United States, not for Mexicans, but for water. For water, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Sort of levees. Yeah. We build levees all around the United States. Except they better go, we have to include Canada because we don't want it leaking in to the St. Lawrence. But you there know, were big, big climate shifts in the past, and they just right. didn't pass. And, and, you know, we argue, well, it's man-made, well, it's, it's not man-made. You know something? Well, you know what dealing with it means, though? If we can mitigate it, mm -hmm. because dealing with it may mean we're going to be looking at a new desert in the, in the Midwest. We may be looking at a new desert in the Midwest. 
Now, economically, are we willing to say that? No. Maybe. I don't know. Economically, are we willing to say that, that half of Florida and certainly most of Southern Louisiana will not exist in 20 years? Maybe. You know, they're just going to have to deal with it? Maybe. Maybe. You know, I, I don't know. But that is certainly an international issue that we're going to have to deal with. You know. During all the other major climate changes, the popular human population is not very big. How has the population grown from from a hundred years ago to now? I can't. I, I don't really know what the figures are, but it's got to be two or three times. Yeah. Two billion to seven billion. Yeah. Maybe more than that. And all these humans, all humans have had some effect on. Well, I I I. I don't know that, and, and you know, I'm going to tell you something. I get so sick of politicians talking about stuff they don't know. I don't know. I don't know that science behind climate change. I really don't. But when more, when, when you know, when you got a lot of scientists saying, this is, this is real, I have a hard time saying, reading their stuff and saying, well, it's not. Because it's going to cost us money and we don't want to spend money to do it. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I know it's happening. You know, I don't think there's any question that the sea is rising. I don't think there's any question that the temperature is rising. You know, I don't think there's any question that the Antarctic is melting. You know, we got hunks of Antarctica breaking off. You know, that I see, you can see pictures of. Now, if it's our fault, then we need to do something about it. If it's not our fault, we better prepare for it. And preparing for it doesn't mean ignoring it, you know. Well, so, problem, but this is a new issue. Is it, you know, if it's our fault, it seems like, you know, everybody wants to say, well, you know, the United States needs to do something about it. Yes. Well, so does China, and so, so does, does Russia, the rest of the world. and so does Brazil, well, and so does India. Sure. And those places well, aren't doing anything. We're the only pulled out of Paris Peace Well, we're, we're, but remember, one of the things, that, one of the responses that we're going to get back, and this is part of the international, and you're right, this is where diplomacy, diplomacy, no, we don't hear of diplomacy much anymore. Well, it's really important because if I, if we turn, when we turn, you know, when we turn to, if we turn to India and say, you know, you are sending a lot of carbons into the atmosphere, and you are, you're coal burning. Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's a warm coal. Uh, your plants that burn a carbon substance that I'm not going to identify uh, is contributing to, you know, the pollution and contributing to climate change. And therefore, you need it to stop because we are in this war together. How is India going to respond to you? And what about you people over there? Well, yeah. What, 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 what about about us? Us? And, and they'll say, we, if, they, if, their response, and money, money. if their response is, well, what about you people? We'll say, look, we are taking huge steps oh. to clean up. Now, what are they oh. going? But what are they going to say? We have, we need we to have the resources for our people. That's what they're going to say. They're going to say, that's easy for you to say, you got your industrial revolution 100 years ago. We're experiencing ours now. You're changing the rules to handicap us because of you. You got to burn all that coal and all that oil as much as you wanted and dump all that crud in the rivers as much as you wanted, and now that it's our turn to economically expand, you're telling us what? You can't do, you it. Can't do it. it. You can't yeah. do it because it's, it's polluting our environment. We, you can't do it. And they're going to say, you, you, that, you can't play that game. You can't play that game. And it is, I mean, that's what they're going to say. You know, it's, that's right. It's fine for you to say, but you're dumping on us. I'll tell you, we'll do it. When, when are we going to get some checks in from you to help us do it? Because understand, you are undercutting our industrial expansion that nobody undercut yours. You pay, you help us pay for it, we'll do it. And the United States says, we oh, we're not going to do that because that's helping another country. We can't do that. we got to take care of ourselves. Are we going to solve this problem? I guess we have a problem. I know you got a problem. <laughs> guess and you know what problem, you need? Yeah. You need smart people and diplomacy. And we have you, need small people. Now. you need diplomats. You need people that can we negotiate, no, 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 know how to negotiate. No immigration. My gosh, immigration. Oh, we have a horrible problem with immigration in the United States, right? No. Horrible problem. 
No. Well, when you compare it to what's happening, because in this map, the red areas are the areas that have uh, uh, negative. negative. So the immigration is coming from these areas. The blue areas are receiving immigrants. The green areas are, are, are not, or neither. You know, you look at what's happening in terms of, of immigration. You've got a southern movement, right? You've got a southern movement north, right? To, the, to, to more industrialized areas. And it's not, what are the reasons that motivate immigration? It's living standards. Living standards, economics. What else? Political. Work, Jobs, yeah. political. Life Better and lifestyle. Better War, lifestyle. life and death. Lord have mercy. You're going to tell a Syrian here that they can't immigrate? <laughs> you know, when they got people shooting at you? Well, you need to stay there because we're not going to have Okay. Fine. You have to do it legally. Hmm? You have to do it legally. Yeah, we, we're not going to let you. And, but what we're going to do is we're going to make sure you can't do it legally. We're going to make sure you can't do it legally. But that's the only way you can get it. <laughs> so, if you just happen to get shot in Damascus, well, you should have, you know something? You shouldn't have been born there. You, you shouldn't have been born in Damascus. Damascus. No, now that I'm thinking of it, it's really their fault, right? You know those South Central Americans? Now I'm really fired up. Those Central Americans that are running away from those drug cartels and death squads, those children, you know what? They shouldn't have been Columbia. born. Columbia. Shouldn't have they shouldn't have been born in Guatemala. Mm. <laughs> right? Born Am I not right? <laughs> <laughs> Their fault. We got every right to say no. Right? We're cutting off asylum seekers because we don't want them. They shouldn't have been born. They shouldn't have been born. And that would have decreased the surplus population. Man, I sound like Scrooge. Okay. <laughs> immigration is going to be, is, but immigration is going to go away, right? Yeah. Because yeah. What, we, what the Europeans are going to do is they're going to build a wall right through the Mediterranean. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to build a wall right through here. And uh, Australians are going to build a moat around Australia. <laughs> oh, that's already oh, wait a minute. It's already got a moat. Oh, 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 I forgot that. It's called the evolution. We, we're against immigration now, but what happened when the English speaking came over and settled over in what is now America? Don't yeah. go there. Right? God gave us a right to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the only Americans who should be really fired up about immigration are Native Americans. Uh, <laughs> what are you going to say enough is enough? I don't know. I don't know. I, that's I mean, we're just one yeah. percent. You'll empty those South American countries. No. So, yeah, no. No way. I, I don't know. I don't know. But that's a question. That's what I'm saying. There's a, there's a legitimate question if that has to be answered. The 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 danger. Well, maybe. Yeah. You know, that's what the Vegas had to learn a new language when we came. Well, California was Spain, was and then Mexico. It only became U.S. territory much later. More attractive to stay. You know, I look at my immigrant family that came from all over the world. They came here because there was nothing where they were. Right. And if, if, but if you, if they had had more opportunity where they were, maybe they wouldn't have all come here. That's from. Yeah, but that's why? Why? So, why? Yeah. Well, I don't think. We have, you know, we talk an awful lot about our, the value of human life, but we're investing very little in it in a large part of the world. We're reducing, we're reducing foreign aid. We're not yeah, increasing. And, and so if, if we're going to tell somebody from Guatemala, you need to stay in Guatemala, mm -hmm. what would be the greatest enticement for them to stay in Guatemala? Get them a job. job. Find a way to give them a job. A job now, now yeah, yeah, if, if we could there. do that, if we could do that, that would be that would keep them there. But if we don't do it, then then what do we do? Well, what do we well, do? I don't know. Change the, the government because 
Gavin Newsom just went down and did the whole report in Central America and everything we're doing to train people and Trump has pulled it all off. Well, we have to get we, them to stay there to be viable in economics and everything. And complicated issue. Complicated yes. issue. Complicated. We got yeah. one minute. <laughs> complicated yeah. issue with immigration. Don't know where you draw the line? Don't know. I'll be honest, you know I wear a collar. As a Christian, I have a real hard time. If a child, if a child is coming to the United States to say you can't, you know, can't enter, just as a Christian, because I'm not sure what Jesus would have done. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what Jesus would have done. I'm not saying Jesus would have done this or that. I'm not. I'm not the guy that says Jesus wouldn't want drive an SUV. I'm just not sure what he would do. I have a moral. I have some moral qualms about turning away people. Who are running away from death squads? I, I just feel uncomfortable with that. You know, maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to admit I'm wrong. Politically not astute, maybe. Economically not, I'll I'll go with that. I just have more problems with. I just have more problems. Anyway, nationalism is a huge issue. What's nationalism? Take care of us. Take care of nations. Yes. Nations. We live. We're living in a new resurgence of nationalism. And what undercuts or what what is the foundation of nationalism? Because it's not just it's not just country. What is the foundation of nationalism? Only our travel. own people. What's that? Keep it pure. Travel. Travel? Travel. Okay, travel. Okay, good. And what is part of travel? Thank you. Because you said travel. And see one thing <laughs> teachers do is they say things like Okay. <laughs> and I was having a hard time coming out with travel. Okay. <laughs> what is when we start talking about tribal? What what does it mean to be tribal? It can be no, religious. Okay, correct. Kind. Tribal, You're we share the same religion, we share the, the same politics, we share the same. Oh, you're missing some of the big ones of nationalism. We share territory, territory. Language. even more. Ah, boom! We share the same language. Oh yeah. Man, that's uh, that's one of the foundations of tri of tribalism, of nationalism. We share the same language. We share the same history. We share the same religion. We share the same culture. We eat the same food. We have the same background. That's nationalism. Man, we've got nationalism breaking out everywhere. You know, certainly we see it breaking out in the oddest place, which is the United States. Because the United States was a melting pot of nations. And we are becoming nationalistic, right? Because, and, and the foundation is, we don't want to speak Spanish. Because we are English, right? We speak English. We're fundamentally white, right? You know, we're Anglo-Saxon, Western European. Got to be Protestant too. Protestant? Well, we are not Catholics in. Jews, they, they, they can come in the back door. But but that's okay. You that's our background, right? And that's what nationalism means. And when you hear that, that's nationalist talk. Now I'm not saying nationalism is bad yet. I mean, we've always done it. Nations have always done it. People have always united around nationalist ideas. It just nationalism doesn't become open to other ideas. You know, it just doesn't. You know, uh, well, nationalism in the United States is kind of a is an oxymoron. Used to be an oxymoron. Kind of, yeah, because we're we're a mix of everything, yeah, exactly. and still are. I mean, there's an awful lot of people speaking Spanish. <laughs> yeah, and and it, at one time we thought it was great until it appears as though white males are going to be a minority in 20 years. And now it becomes an issue. How about white women? Oh, white women, well, just uh, just oh, no. European, Western European background are becoming going to be a minority. All right, but nuclear proliferation. My gosh, this is huge. We are terrified. What's going to happen? Somebody's going to shoot us. Somebody else is going to get nuclear weapons. Yeah. Somebody is going to have enough self-control. That's right, because nuclear weapons are <laughs> widespread. You know. I read uh, somebody was, was talking about Israel. You know, Israel, look at how small Israel is. You know, confronted with all these things. Well, you know, Israel's not nuclear weapons. They really they do. They just don't talk about it. They just don't talk about it. They get nuclear weapons. You know, they're surrounded by a bunch of Arab states, and all those Arab states know what? 
They Israel's got nuclear weapons. <laughs> Don't mess with them. You know, well, are they stupid? Are the Arab states stupid? No. no. Most no. leaders are not stupid. They really aren't. That's how they got to be leaders. <laughs> they don't want to see, you know, the, even uh, Assad doesn't want to see Damascus vaporized. You know, he, you may hear, he's crazy. He don't want to see Damascus vaporized. Israel's got nuclear weapons. That's why nobody's going to mess with Israel. <laughs> Israel is terrified that who else is going to get nuclear weapons? Iran. Iran, Iran is going to get nuclear Iran. weapons. And now if Iran has nuclear weapons, that they've got nuclear weapons, now you've got this man again. Now you've got this confrontation between nuclear weapons. North Korea. Oh, yeah. What's going to happen there? What's going to happen in North Korea? My gosh, what's going to happen in North Korea? And, you know, from... You know, again, you've got powers down... And I, I hope you're not, I'm not, I don't want to take a position, I just want to voice, you know, the conflict involved. You know, you got to, you may have a power like Iran, if they, if you pushed them, they could very well say, well, you got them, you got them, who stopped you from getting them? Why are you, why don't we have the right to have what you have? Why don't we have the right to have what you have? What gives you the right to do it? Well, we've got economic power. Well, we do, and we can claim that right. That's fine. But the response is going to be, we just want what you already have. And we will never have it as good as you. It wants to share. Yeah. Remember, that was one of the things after World War II. You know, somebody like Oppenheimer said, what we need oh. to do is share nuclear power, weapons. Yeah. <laughs> because if everybody has them, then it's not a big deal. Everybody has them. You know? Yeah, until somebody gets yeah, somebody, somebody, on the fire. Yeah, you yeah. make some mistake. One, there's one slide, and then I'm going to let you go, and you've been very, very patient. I want you to look at this. This is, this is really cool, I think. Uh, this is, if you, you know, we know what countries look like, right? But if we decided to make their size representative of their populations, of their populations, this is what the world would look like. Now, as you as you look at this, as you as you look at this, popular in terms of population, where would the power seem to be? China and India. Okay. Well, when you look at Japan, you know that's not shabby either. Philippines. That's not shabby. Indonesia. You realize the largest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia? Yeah, but it's going underwater. And yeah. and so you've got billions coming off grounded. <laughs> yeah, but they're going to be swimming, you know. <laughs> Where the heck is Russia at? What about the internet threat? Cyber. <laughs> <Just Cyber>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's another one that I didn't even put on. You know, cyber. Good night. Oh, and and we're gonna to need to look at it. We got an election coming up in twenty twenty. Yeah. You know, did the Russians interfere with the election in yes. and twenty sixteen? Did they interfere yeah. with the election in twenty eighteen? Yes. Will they interfere with the election in twenty twenty? Definitely. I don't know. More. Certainly our people, you know, the the people who are supposed to know say yes. Other people say absolutely not. I don't know. It seems to break down to the people who like the results say no. The people who don't like the results say yes. Does anybody know how they interfered? Okay, we can say that, but nobody has pointed to specifics what they did. Well, I don't. They dumped it. They, yeah, they dumped a lot of faults. Yeah, information. It's mainly social it's media. Mainly social media it's and not, mostly it's not the election itself. False information. Although in eight, in 2018, there's some suggestion yeah, that yeah. they like infiltrated Florida. in Florida yeah, actual uh, voting. You uh, know, machine. the voting machines that they infiltrated. That not they're not suggesting in 2016, but right. they certainly did it. They're suggesting it in 2018. The Russians dumped a lot of uh, robot. They they dumped a lot of money. Into the election in 2016, all, all the, the Russians did. Which they target. Oh yeah, them. I don't think there's any question that there's proof that the Russians did. The Mueller report says they did. The Mueller report establishes very clearly that the Russians spent a lot of money in the United States 19 and 2016 election. Now, 
whether it's appropriate or not, whether the, the candidates knew or not, I don't know. But I don't think there's, there's much doubt that the Russians spent a lot of money. But you can't stop United that. States. Well, some people, the, a lot depends on who wins. You know, if you like the winner, then you're not going to stop it. Because that's a good thing. I had a conversation with a friend, and, and they said, I don't care if the Russians did it as long as Blop wins. Don't care. That's a good thing. Okay. Until the other candidate. Until the other candidate wins. Until the Chinese decide to back the other one. All right. Friends. We'll see you in the fall. Go. I'll see you in the fall. Good old wedding. I got a wedding to do. Don't eat too much. I don't even know that there's going to be a, a reception. <laughs>